for joining us. We just wanted to say a big thank you to everyone who has made a decision to partner with us. We know it hasn't been an easy time and so therefore we want to thank you for continuing to push forward in big faith and honouring God in your financial giving. We're blessed to be a blessing and it's amazing that so many of you continue to invest in our missions and outreach causes. Your giving continues to impact the lives of local and international communities, such as the children from our Orphanage Shepherd Centre Foundation and many others. We're so grateful to have the opportunity to partner with you and make a difference and note that your sacrificial giving does not go unnoticed. We can take encouragement from Luke 6, 38 that says, Give and it will be given to you. You will have more than enough. It can be pressed down and shaken together and it will still run over as it is given to you. The way you give to others will be the way you receive in return. Amen, guys. What a powerful word. And we are believing for your lives to prosper in ways that you can never imagine. So be expectant. God is so, so faithful and he knows exactly what you need. There's still opportunity to jump in and partner with us. So if you haven't done so already, you can give your tithes and missions and offering through online banking to any of our accounts. Just remember to reference your name and the cause of which you would like to donate to. You can drop us a note at c3churchmanager2014 at yahoo.com if you need further information. Once again, guys, thank you so much for your generous contributions. Do stay connected with us across all of our social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Stay in faith, stay healthy, and be blessed. Good morning, and a warm welcome to our Sunday celebration. Thank you for joining us today. We shall partake of communion. Communion is very significant as it reminds us of our covenant with Christ. When Jesus first demonstrated the concept of communion to the disciples, he said the bread represents his body. He sustains us, he fulfills us, he meets our needs. We know him as the bread of life. The other thing that he said is, this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sins now the beautiful thing about the covenant that we have with christ is that it is eternal there is no other covenant no agreement no contract on this earth that is timeless that transcends lifetimes think about even sacred covenants a covenant like the covenant of marriage where you have two people standing at the altar staring into each other's eyes and they say their vows they say till death do us part. That means even that will come to an end. Our covenant with Christ, however, transcends this lifetime into eternity. As with any contract, as with any agreement, two parties come together and they each bring something to the table. What we bring to the table is our faith. We trust in God. We trust that God is who he says he is and that he will do what he says he will do. This is a covenant of faith. And what God does is what he brings to the table are his promises, promises regarding our well-being, regarding our destiny, promises regarding the fulfillment of, of our calling and our purpose here on earth. And because this is an eternal covenant, we have unhindered, unrestricted access to those promises and to the word of God. He will meet us at our point of need. Jeremiah 17 verses 14 to 15 says, Heal me, Lord, and I will be healed. Save me and I will be saved. For it is you that I praise. They keep saying to me, where is the word of the Lord? Let it be fulfilled now. It is so encouraging to know that the word of God shall be fulfilled in our lives. 
Now, as we think about this covenant of sacrifice, because it was a sacrificial act for Jesus to lay his life for us. He sacrificed his life. It was a very selfless act. We think about that in gratitude and in honor, but we also think about the promise of restoration in our lives. God restores our health. He restores our finances. He restores relationships. He restores our careers. He restores our souls. He restores our peace. He is ready to restore any and every area in our lives that is broken. You may be thinking, I'm at my wit's end. My back is against the wall. I don't know how I'm going to go through this particular situation. You may be thinking, well, already in the second half of the year, how will I get through? Well, the good news is we serve a God who is not hindered by time, nor is he hindered by circumstance. Instead, he's faithful. He is just and he is mighty and he will bring breakthrough in our lives. He is a promise keeper and a covenant keeper and the word of God shall be fulfilled in our lives. I encourage you now to think of the specific areas in your life where you need restoration and we will pray and in faith we will pray believing and standing together for the fulfillment of the promises of God over your life. Now take the bread and the wine and let's pray. Thank you, Father, that you are promise keeper, that you are miracle worker, that you are a way maker. Thank you, Father, that your word shall be fulfilled in our lives, that you bring restoration, O oh God, in every area. You bring restoration in our health, in relationships, in finances, in our careers. You bring restoration, Father God, a restoration of peace and restoration in our souls. We thank you, Lord, that we shall live to testify of your goodness and that we shall shout from the mountaintops of the miracles that we that you perform in our lives. In Jesus' name. Let's take the bread and the wine. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. Be blessed and enjoy the rest of the service.
Good morning, everybody, and welcome to church for another great Sunday. It's a joy to always speak to you, especially when you are in your living room with loved ones and family. I trust you enjoyed the worship time, communion. Man, it was so powerful just to be in the presence of God and to know that God is real and that He cares for you, every one of you. We have a special guest speaker all the way from Singapore, Pastor Lawrence Koo, who is a senior pastor of his church and also the GLS leader in Singapore. He has a passion and a prophetic edge in, his, in the way he preaches. He has been in leadership uh, all, for many years. He has pastored in Malaysia and Singapore, as I've said. But when he speaks, he speaks from the depths of his heart and he has got such a, such a love for the Word of God and for how the church should function. And so today we are honoured and blessed to have him. He is our personal friend. He and Nettie have been pastoring and pioneering churches and have cared for the work of God in his country and in many other countries as well. So today we are very happy to introduce our friend and our speaker for this morning. God bless you. Open your hearts and your lives and I'm sure the Lord will speak to you. Thank you. Now, today I want to speak to you on building church unity through the power of prayer. Now, why do I preach on church unity in times of COVID-19 pandemic? There are at least three reasons I can think of. First, we have been kept apart from one another physically for so long. And who knows, this situation may persist for a while. You know, after a prolonged period of not being able to gather as a church, somehow the sense of unity may be diluted as some people may not see the need of a local church and some may even drop out from the church. And second reason is, right now, virtually all the churches are doing online church services. It's a virtual church, so to speak. We don't know who among the members would actually tune in to the church online services. And the fact is, there are thousand and one online services people can have access to. And this may undermine the importance and value of a local church. And the third reason is, when the time comes, when we can come back again, gather together, we will probably still need to maintain safety measures. Our normal ways of church life will change, at least for some time. It will be a new normal, which is really abnormal as far as church life is concerned. I mean, can you imagine no handshakes, no hugs, no joining of hands, no interactions, no fellowship over meals as a church? And these are the normal physical expressions of church unity. And they are being curbed or restricted, at least for some time until a vaccine is found. On Sunday, 21st June, DPM Heng Sui Kiat spoke concerning Singapore as a nation in COVID-19 crisis. He said emphatically in his speech, we will emerge stronger as one people, our sense of identity and values renew. I wonder if we could say the same about the church. Will our church emerge stronger as one people? Will our sense of identity and values renew? That is why the Lord laid on my heart the burden to speak to you on building church unity. One of the prerequisites to building church unity is through the power of prayer. So let me begin with the scriptures reading from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18, verse 15 to 20. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his faults between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, Take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established 
by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Now here Jesus was dealing with the reality of life in a church. And there are at least two realities concerning church life. First, church is never perfect. Jesus said in verse 15, if your brother sins against you. The truth is, there will always be offences in church. There is no perfect church on earth. If you don't want to be hurt or offended, then don't join a church. Why? Because people in church are just like you and I, imperfect and sinful in nature. So sooner or later, you will be hurt by people in church. You know, somebody once said that every church looks beautiful from far, but it's far from beautiful. John Aubert, who is a pastor and an author of many books, he wrote a book with an interesting title. And the title is, Everybody is Normal Till You Get to Know Them. And I think this pretty much describes a church. The second reality of a church is that church is about relationship. Jesus said, if your brother sins against you. You know, people in church are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are children of our Heavenly Father. We belong to God's family. The blood of Jesus Christ run through our spiritual veins. We all share the same spiritual DNA through the new birth of the Holy Spirit. Now, because church is not perfect and church is all about relationship, these are the two greatest challenges in building church unity. It is no wonder Apostle Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. You know, church unity takes a lot of efforts to keep. Church unity is a high-maintenance business which requires a lot of intentionality and energy to make it happen. And that intentionality and energy is through the power of prayer in unity. Three things happen when we pray in unity. First, we have the power to defeat our common enemy. Matthew 18 verse 18, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And here Jesus was talking about the authority and the power of prayer. Through the power of prayer, we have the authority to bind and to lose. What we lose and bind on earth has an effect in the heavenly realm or in the spiritual atmosphere. In other words, through prayer, we have the power to release and to restrain the spiritual forces which will inevitably affect the church life. In fact, earlier in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 to 19, Jesus said to Peter the same thing. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. 
So you see, the church has one common enemy, and that is Satan. And the only way to overcome the power of Satan is through the power of united prayer in Jesus' name. Ephesians chapter 6 is about the engagement of spiritual warfare. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. In other words, we don't fight against one another, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. You know, it's very sad to see that whenever there are hurts or misunderstanding happen in the church, people turn against one another. We blame, we criticize one another, not realizing that the real enemy, Satan, is the one who makes you of people in church to sow seeds of discord and to stir up troubles. So we end up fighting one another instead of our common enemy, the devil. And then Paul went on to talk about putting on the full armor of God to confront the power of darkness. And you and I know very well, the armor of God includes belt of truth, breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And this is what we know about the armor of God. But it is not full. It is not full armor of God. Because next verse opens with a conjunction, and. In grammar, a conjunction is a word that joins two phrases or sentences, to, sentences together. So Paul went on to say in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18 to 20, he said, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. You know, five times the word pray or praying appeared in these three verses. You know, whenever you read the Bible and whenever you come across certain word keeps repeating or recurring in a certain passage, it means that we have to pay special attention to it because it's very important. Don't miss it. And the thing is, God has given us the authority and power through prayer over Satan, over Satan's power. Through the power of prayer, we can defeat him. So use it. Don't just talk about it. Act on it. So next time you have an issue with a brother or sister in church, don't be quick to turn against one another. Pray to God. Pray for healing of hurts. Pray for love. Pray for that brother or sister who hurts you. You see, when we allow our hurts to fester in our souls and hearts, they can turn into anger. And uncontrolled anger will lead us to sin. And this allows the devil to find an inroad to our life and to the church. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 says, Do not let the sun go down upon you while you are still angry. For anger gives a foothold to the devil. So don't let the enemy have a foothold in our life or church. Once you let the, the devil have a foothold, he will build a stronghold. The second thing that happens when we pray in unity is that God will hear and respond to our prayers. Matthew 18, 19 says, Jesus said, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth and asking anything, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. You know, there is power in the prayer of God's people when it is expressed through agreement, 
Jesus said, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, you see, the reason why there is a need to agree is because there is disagreement. And it causes hurts. So how do we agree in spite of our disagreement? The answer is reconciliation. You know, the word reconciliation means to resolve our differences, to re reunite the broken relationships. To reconcile, it requires the parties involved to forgive. Right after Jesus talked about the agreement in prayer, Peter came to Jesus and asked him a troubling question. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 to 22, Peter approached Jesus and said, Lord, how many times do I have to forgive my fellow believer who keeps offending me? Seven times? And Jesus, Jesus answered, no, nope, not seven times, but 70 times, 70 times. To illustrate this point, Jesus told a parable of a king has many servants who owe him money. And he found one servant owing him millions of dollars and cannot pay him. So the king ordered the servant to be sold along with his wife, his children and everything he owned, he owned to settle the debt. But the man fell down before the king and begged him. The servant cried, Please have mercy on me and give me more time. I will repay you. So the king felt sorry for him and the king forgave all his debt. You know, the story goes on to say that after the servant had been forgiven of his debt that he couldn't pay, he met one of his fellow servants who owed him a few thousand dollars. And he seized him by the throat and began to choke him, saying, you better pay me right now everything you owe me. And his fellow servant begged him, have mercy on me. If you just give me more time, I will repay you all that I owe you. You know, but the servant who had his debt forgiven by the king refused to forgive his fellow servant who owed him. Instead, he took his fellow servant and put him in prison. You know, when some of the other servants heard about this, they went to the king and told him everything that had happened. And the king was so angry and he summoned the servant who had been forgiven and he said to him, You evil servant, I forgave you that huge debt that you couldn't pay because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I have mercy on you? Then the king sent the servant to prison to be tortured. Then Jesus gave the punchline at the end of the story. Found in Matthew chapter 18, verse 35. Jesus said, that is what my heavenly Father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. You know, that same warning was also given in Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15. Follows after the Lord's prayer. Jesus said, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your heavenly Father will not forgive your sins. You know, God always forgives us on the account of Jesus. So in the same way, we are to forgive those who sin against us. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, it says, Forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. You know, there can be no unity in church if there is no forgiveness. Without forgiveness, unity is unattainable and God's will cannot be done in the church. Whatever we pray, it will be in vain. Unforgiving heart actually imprisons us. And the prison is a metaphor of spiritual bondage. We become bound or chained to our past hurts and offences. And we are never free. Our prayers will never be heard. The church suffers defeat 
and our enemy wins. The third thing that will happen when we pray in unity is God's presence will be made manifest among us. In Matthew 18, verse 20, Jesus said, For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. You know, this verse is often quoted or used in church gatherings or services. But this promise of God's manifest presence is made in the context of church unity. It doesn't mean that just because we meet together in Jesus' name, God is obliged to show up. The thing is, it won't happen if there is no unity. So it doesn't matter how often we gather as a church or as a group. If there is no unity, if people are unwilling to release forgiveness, the presence of God will be dissipated, vanish. All the meetings in the Lord's name become fruitless and meaningless. But when God's people are united and are willing to resolve the differences and to release forgiveness, God's presence will be made manifest in our midst. And let me close with Psalm 133, a beautiful and a powerful psalm. It says, Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head, running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing life forevermore. Psalm 133 is a traditional, traditional hymn sung by the Jews. In many of their festivals, Jews always gather around their festivals. And when they do, they sing this hymn, Psalm 133. It speaks of the power of unity, which brings about God's anointing and God's presence among His people. There are two elements mentioned in Psalm, Psalm 133. The oil and the dew. The oil that drips down from Aaron's head, who is the high priest, and flows down all the way to the very fringe of his priestly robe. The robe which covers his body. And this is a powerful picture of unity that starts with church leadership. When the leaders are united, the anointing of God's presence comes down to the whole church. Then the dew of Mount Hermon. It signifies the refreshing presence of God. It falls on Mount Zion. You know, between Mount Hermon and Mount Zion, it's about 100 miles in distance. That is about 160 kilometers. Mount Hermon is the highest mountain located in Israel. It, it is usually covered with snow on top. Mount Hermon represents God's dwelling place. Mount Zion is in Jerusalem. Zion is the type of the church. Now when there is unity in the church, God's presence will come down like the dew of Mount Hermon and it falls down to Mount Zion, the church. That's why Acts 3.19 says, times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Yes, refreshing of God's presence will come when the brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. It is in our unity that God commands the blessing on His church. And it is life forevermore. You know, many of you know that I enjoy watching movies, in particular action thriller based on true stories. And last year, I watched one such movie called Seven Days in Enderby. And the movie is about a successful counter-terrorist hostage rescue mission carried out by commandos of the Israel Defense Forces at Enderby Airport in Uganda on 4th of July 1976, exactly 44 years ago. What happened was, a week earlier, 
on 27 of June, an Air France jet liner with 248 passengers had been hijacked by the terrorists. The hijackers demanded Israel to free 40 Palestinians in, pre in the prison uh, in, pre in, in Israel in exchange for the hostages. And the flight which had originated in Tel Aviv with the destination of Paris was diverted to Enderby, the main airport of Uganda. Because the Ugandan uh, government under the director, the dictator, uh, Idi Amin, supported the hijackers. In fact, he personally welcomed the hijackers when the plane landed. The hijackers later freed the non-Israeli hostages. But 94 Israeli passengers, along with the 12 member Air France crew, remained as hostages and were threatened with death if the demand was not met. And the defense uh, force of Israel launched a rescue operation that took place at night. 100 Israeli commandos were flown to Uganda for the rescue operation. The operation took a week of planning. That is why the movie is called Seven Days in Enderby. And of the 106 remaining hostages, 102 were rescued and four were killed. One of them who was killed was the unit commando, commander, um, Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan, Jonathan Netanyahu, the brother of Benjamin Netanyahu, who would later become the Prime Minister of Israel. You know, it was said that while the 100 Israeli commandos were on this rescue mission, they were singing Psalm 133 on their way from Tel Aviv to Enderby. They realized the importance and the power of unity in such a dangerous rescue mission. They looked to God for His presence and protection. They sang as a prayer to God as they moved together as one people. Church, we too have a rescue mission in this critical time. We have been sent by the Commander-in-Chief, the Lord Jesus Christ, to go and free those who have been held captive by Satan. But we can only accomplish that task, our mission, if we are united as a church through the power of prayer. So will we emerge stronger as a church and as one people in the crisis of COVID-19 pandemic? I believe when the church prays in unity, no power of hell can prevail against the church. God will hear and respond to our prayer. God's presence will be with us. Good morning, church fam, and thank you so much for joining us. So guys, embrace yourselves because next week, we are going to be joined by the fantastic Pastor Doug Williams all the way from the UK. Pastor Doug is the Senior Pastor of Emmanuel Community Church International, a thriving inner city church in the East End of London. He often consults on leadership, men's ministry and worship, so you can be guaranteed that he's got a fantastic, power-packed message on his heart just for us. So guys, Jump On Board is happening next week, Sunday the 29th of July, 10 a.m. online. Invite your family and friends because they are not going to want to miss this one. Thanks for listening, guys. Stay connected with us across our social media platforms for further updates. And I will see you guys next week.